And we now come to the preaching of God's word. And so I invite you to take your copy of God's word and open to Romans chapter two. We're going to be in verses one to five. And as we saw last time, I think it can be said that the moral fabric of our society is coming apart at the seams. And yet, even in a society like ours, There are those who consider themselves to be moral, who condemn the moral insanity of our culture, who are horrified at the trajectory of our nation, and who denounce our society's utter inability to make sound moral judgments. And so they would stand with the Apostle Paul and give hearty approval to the condemnation of them. And yet Paul needs to demonstrate that they too are objects of the wrath of God. And so Paul now needs to indict them, to indict the self-righteous, the the moral among us, by proving that unless they too repent, they won't escape the judgment of God. And so look with me at Romans 2, verse 1 and following, as Paul begins to address the self-righteous. He writes, therefore, you have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment for that, for in that in which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O man? When you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. As Paul sets forth the gospel of God, he needs to establish two realities. One, that the whole world is under the condemnation of sin, both Jew and Gentile alike. And two, that no one will be justified by means of the works of the law, neither Jew nor Gentile. Where to be justified is to be counted righteous in God's sight. And to be counted righteous is to possess both salvation and deliverance from the wrath to come. And the reason that Paul needs to establish these two realities is that the gospel is the power of God for salvation and that his saving power is laid hold of entirely by faith. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so Paul needs to level the playing field between Jew and Gentile. And at this point in the flow of his argument, he has indicted the entire Gentile world. He has indicted them for suppressing the truth about God and unrighteousness, for refusing to honor God or give him thanks, for becoming futile in their speculations, for exchanging the glory of the incorruptible God to worship the creature, for sexual impurity, for their homosexuality, for the depravity of their minds, and for not only practicing the vices laid out in verses 29 to 31, but also for giving hearty approval to those who practice them. They are without excuse. And up until now, The Jew has been applauding Paul for his indictment of the Gentiles. He finds himself to be in hearty agreement and would absolutely concur that the Gentile world are deserving of the wrath of God. And so Paul now needs to indict the Jew to prove that his position is no better and that he too is under the judgment of God. And that's what Paul does from Romans 2, 1 all the way to the end of Romans 3, 8. He turns his gaze to the Jew 
and begins to dismantle his self-righteousness. And you see a similar approach taken by the prophet Amos. Because after pronouncing judgment on the nations in connection with the day of the Lord, the prophet Amos turns his attention to Israel and effectively asks them, do you think you will fare better in that day? And goes on to declare that the day of the Lord will be a day of judgment for them too. And yet, how do we know that Paul has turned his attention specifically to the Jew at this point? Well, Paul actually names his audience in verse 17 where he says, but if you bear the name Jew. So Paul names his opponent in verse 17. But it's also apparent leading up to that. In verse 11, he writes, for there is no partiality with God. And he does so on the heels of declaring that God's judgment is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And in verses 12 to 16, Paul makes the point that it isn't the hearers of the law who will be justified. It's the doers of the law who will be. Identifying the Jew as one who merely hears the law. Since he's incapable of doing the law apart from the enabling power of the spirit. And so Paul definitely has the Jew in mind throughout this section. And yet, though that be true, Paul's language here is elastic enough to not only indict the unbelieving Jew, but, but to also indict anyone trusting in their own moral standing. To the extent that Romans 2, 1 to 5 condemns any and all self-righteousness, where self-righteousness is believing that you are righteous enough in yourself to warrant acceptance with God. And so these verses both expose and condemn all self-righteousness. And we want to come under the full weight of them. As Paul is setting forth the gospel of God and is working toward that glorious moment when he will put forward Christ And his work on the cross as a demonstration of the righteousness of God. We want to feel all of the weight of the judgment that leads up to that. So that we can feel with the the, the reader of Romans. The the first reader of Romans. the, The weight and necessity of Christ. We want to ensure that there are none among us trusting in their own righteousness. And so we're going to see five features of self-righteousness. Five features of self-righteousness. In the hopes that each one of us here would be open and laid bare before God. Where we would know that that self-righteousness is no righteousness at all. And where we would then look to God for the, the only righteousness that saves the very righteousness that only he supplies. And the first feature is this, the condemnation of self-righteousness, the condemnation of self-righteousness. Look at verse one, Paul writes, therefore, you have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment for in that in which you judge another, you condemn yourself for you who practice or for rather for you who judge practice the same thing. Now, you'll note that verse 1 begins with therefore. And deciphering the exact logical function of therefore at the the start of the verse is somewhat difficult. But the idea seems to be this. That in the same way that the Gentile is without excuse, not only knowing that God is, but also knowing the ordinance of God, verse 32, so too are you without excuse. And the rest of the verse will unpack why. But who does the you refer to? Where it says, therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you. To whom is Paul speaking? Well, it's important to note that the you here is a second person singular. So Paul has a particular individual in mind. One who meets the characteristics of verses one to five. And yet the individual to whom Paul speaks is actually hypothetical. He's employing a literary style called diatribe. 
where he's manufacturing a dialogue with a hypothetical opponent. And in this case, the opponent is a Jew, a Jew who would be righteous in his own estimation, in himself, and would survey the landscape of God's judgment on the nations and would applaud it and say yes and amen. And Paul's opponent has taken the bait, hook, line, and sinker. He would have looked at everything that Paul had said in chapter one and would have said, yes, Paul, you are quite right. The conduct of the nations is completely deplorable. They are fools, totally deserving of the judgment of God, an utterly despicable people given over to the worst expressions of immorality. They are heathens. They are idolaters. And it's shocking that God even gives them the very breath with which they breathe. So he passes judgment on the Gentiles and thereby proves he knows the ordinance of God. And so Paul charges his opponent as being without excuse. And the reason he's without excuse is expressed in the middle of the verse where it says there, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. So it's by virtue of passing judgment on another that this hypothetical opponent ends up indicting himself. To condemn yourself is to pronounce a sentence of guilt on yourself. And so again, by assuming the seat of judgment and passing judgment on others, you inadvertently sentence yourself. And really, this is a reiteration of what Jesus teaches elsewhere with respect to hypocritical and self-righteous judgment in that by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you, Matthew 7, verse 2. That your judgment of others will actually contribute to the judgment that you receive. Will even contribute to the standard by which you will be judged. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive what? Mercy. But you say, well, how can it be that by judging another, you condemn yourself? Well, look at the end of verse 1. It says, for you who practice, rather for you who judge, practice the same things. Which is to say that you practice the same things that you condemn in others. And that's why you're without excuse. So there's hypocrisy here. There's identifying what is evil and wrong in others while practicing the same things. And just consider the comparison between the individuals of verse 32 in chapter 1 and Paul's opponent here in verse 1. There's a stunning contrast. Both know the ordinance of God. Both violate the ordinance of God. The difference is that one violates God's ordinance while giving hearty approval to those who do likewise. And the other violates the same ordinance while passing judgment on those who do. And so that's what it looks like to put the reprobate and the moralist side by side. Both violate the ordinance of God. Both obviously know the ordinance of God. One gives hearty approval to those who practice the same things, and the other indicts them for it. One fans the flames of immorality. The other is a hypocrite condemning the very thing that he does himself. Neither one is very pretty. And yet you might be thinking, how can Paul say that the moral person practices the same things as the reprobate? How can Paul say the Jew practices the same things as the Gentile? Well, in some sense, both are idolaters. I mean, neither one worships God the way they ought to. The Gentile worships the creation. The Jew effectively worships who? Himself. His own ability 
his human achievement, his own righteousness, which he thinks he has. He even prays to himself, as the Lord depicts in Luke 18, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. And that's self-worship. And really the same things of our verse here in Romans 2.1 likely has the vices of verses 29 to 31 in view. That when Paul is saying that the Jew practices the same things, he's really referring to that vice list that Paul has just given. And really, you can just put yourself through that list. Can you see unrighteousness in yourself? How about wickedness, greed, and evil? Or envy, murder, and strife? You say, well, I've never murdered someone. Have you not read? Jesus says that to be angry with your brother is to be tantamount to murder. And to render you guilty, guilty of fiery hell, Matthew 5. Verse 22, what about deceit? Have you ever lied? Misrepresented the truth or malice? Have you ever been mean or hurtful to others or gossip, slander? Who can claim that they are without guilt with respect to these things? Have you ever been violent, arrogant, prideful, or scheming to do evil? Or how about this? Have you ever disobeyed your parents? That was in Paul's vice list too. Have you ever been foolish, untrustworthy, unfeeling toward others, or unmerciful? The fact of the matter is that all of us have sinned and fall short of God's glory. And if that's the case, what's Paul's opponent doing here? He's banking on the fact that though he may be guilty of the same things, he's guilty to a lesser degree. That though he may be sinful, he isn't as sinful. Or he's counting on receiving a more lenient judgment. That because he has something going for himself, God's judgment isn't going to fall to him the same way. And so Paul needs to move this diatribe along. And that leads us to the second feature of self-righteousness. And it's this. The affirmation of self-righteousness. The affirmation of self-righteousness. Look at verse 2. It says, And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. And notice what Paul has done here. He employs the pronoun we. So he's making an affirmation that both he and his opponent would be in agreement on. That God's judgment is just, and that those who practice the sins of Romans 1 are worthy of his judgment. And that God's judgment is just is expressed throughout the Old Testament, and in particular in the Psalms. Listen to Psalm 9 and verse 4. It says, For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne judging righteously. In Psalm 9-7, But the Lord abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment. And then Psalm 9 and verse 8. And he will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. These are claims that God's judgment is just. Listen to Psalm 96, 11 and following. It says this, let the heavens be glad. And let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar in all it contains. Let the field exult in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. For he is coming to judge the earth. 
He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. And then similarly, Psalm 98, verse 7 and following, let the sea roar and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. And so Paul's opponent would be in full agreement. Yes, God's judgment is just. He is righteous in his judgment. The judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. And yet that wording there that says rightly falls is literally according to truth. So this is saying that the judgment of God is according to the truth or according to the facts as they are. And for the Jew, bound up in the truth is the fact that he belongs to the covenant people of God. And he believes that his privileged status renders him exempt from God's judgment. He either views himself to be less liable or as being entitled to mercy. But either way, he believes that God's judgment will fall differently to him. He's got a double standard. And Paul will go on to recognize that, yes, the Jew has a a covenant place. There is a privileged status, but he will demonstrate that that privilege actually renders them what? More accountable. He to whom much is given what? Much is required. And this is what self-righteousness does. It always views itself in the best possible light. And will employ all kinds of justifications for why a person either will be or deserves to be treated differently. Even if those justifications aren't ever expressed outwardly, but only inwardly in the heart. I mean, just consider some of the ways that a person might claim to justify that they're exempt from God's judgment. They might appeal to their religious background and believe that they possess the right religious heritage and that they're exempt of God's judgment on account of that. Or maybe it's their ethnic background. They may believe that they have an ethnic heritage that affords to them some kind of privileged status in the eyes of God. Or maybe it's their family background. They believe they were born into the right family and that by virtue of their familial status that they have something before God to claim. Could be their historical background. That something in their past, something in their history, whether corporately as a people or as an individual, like some great measure of suffering or something, garners some kind of acceptance with God or garners his mercy to be toward them in a way that it's not toward others, garners partiality with God. Or maybe it's their political background. They believe they've got the right politics and the right kind of political ideology, no pun intended. And they believe that their political ideology garners favor with God, whatever it is. Self-righteousness always finds a way to diminish a person's liability before God. Which leads Paul to a heart-probing question, two of them actually. The first of which comes in verse 3. So note third, the supposition of self-righteousness. The supposition of self-righteousness. Again, verse 3, but do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God 
And implicitly he does. Implicitly the self-righteous one who judges others and does the same things, believes that he's going to escape God's judgment. As irrational as it is, the self-righteous man or woman seems to think that they can pass judgment on others, do the very same things, and not enter into the judgment of God. In fact, it's almost as if the the self-righteous person believes that they're absolved of God's judgment by virtue of passing right judgment on others. That by judging others for their wrongdoing, somehow in that they're justified. And what Paul is doing here is he is setting the stage for the fact that no one is exempt from the judgment of God. No one. That it's appointed to men once to die, and then comes what? Judgment. Hebrews 9.27. In fact, even if you were to abstain from passing judgment, even if you resolved in your heart that you will not judge others for their wrongs, you still would not be delivered because you would still have your own sin and unrighteousness before God. You would still be on the hook for your own violations of the holiness of God. And the standard that you must meet to survive the judgments of God is a perfect standard. You need a perfect record of righteousness. Because as James 1.10 says, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point has become guilty of all. Rendering each one of us transgressors of the law. And when that judgment comes, you won't be able to appeal to anything in yourself, not to your religion, not to your ethnicity, not to your family, not to your historicity, not to your politics, not to your covenant status, not to your church membership or your church attendance or to your baptism or to any other religious achievement. You can appeal to nothing in that moment Before God, at his judgment, the only features that will factor in are you, a perfect accounting of every violation of the law of God, and a perfect and holy judge. And so Paul is beginning to probe the heart of the self-righteous to get his or her attention that There is a problem here. If there is a judgment, and if the standard that must be met is perfection, and the self-righteous one knows for sure that they have come short of that perfection, then this is not looking good. That's heart-probing question number one. Now the next, and so note fourth, The miscalculation of self-righteousness. The miscalculation of self-righteousness. Verse 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? And in posing this second question, Paul isn't offering an alternative to the heart attitude exposed by the first. Instead, he's seeking to expose it more fully, to amplify it. And that Paul is indicting the Jew here is further supported by the language of this question. Because the riches of God's kindness, tolerance, and patience is covenantal language. And the unbelieving Jew, either wittingly or unwittingly, thinks lightly of the riches of God's kindness. Where to think lightly means to look down on something with contempt, with the implication that they consider it of little value. 
could be rendered to scorn or despise. They show contempt for the kindness of God. And so the self-righteous person is plagued by an attitude of entitlement. They believe that God owes them the riches of his kindness. And therefore, they don't esteem the, the riches of God's kindness to be riches at all. God's kindness is his goodness or benevolence. And his tolerance could be rendered forbearance and refers to his restraint in the outworking of his wrath. And his patience refers to his state of being able to bear up under provocations. And so God not only demonstrates kindness toward the sinner, toward the self-righteous, But he even restrains his wrath and bears up under the provocation of their offenses. And Paul is referring to the riches of these things, the plentiful and abundant supply of them. I mean, these are attributes of God that to the ruined sinner are marvelous and precious. And yet to the self-righteous, these things aren't precious at all. The self-righteous act like God's indebted to them. And as a result, they fail to realize the purpose of God's kindness. Look at the last half of verse 4. It says there, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. You see, in the eyes of a self-righteous person, God's kindness and patience simply reinforce their lofty and exalted view of themselves. That they're the rightful recipients of God's divine favor. And that they have nothing to be concerned with, with respect to God's judgment. But what they fail to realize is that they're not only viewing with contempt the kindness of God, but are also presuming upon his patience. The kindness of God is to what? It's to lead you to repentance. And repentance is a radical change of heart, a a, a radical reorienting of the heart where you're more horrified at the sin within than you are with the sin in society, where you're prepared to count everything you would have appealed to as being of value and count it loss, where the riches of God's kindness, tolerance, and patience become dearly precious to you, where you're ready now to look to God for the righteousness that only he can supply, abandoning all self-righteousness. And where you're willing to yield up your life to God and allow him to use your life in any way that he he sees fit in accordance with his word. That's what kindness is supposed to do. It's to generate repentance. It's to produce repentance, a change of heart. And if the riches of God's kindness is to lead you to repentance, and so too is his patience. And as is implied in the context of patience, patience is what? It's limited. God will not strive with man forever, Genesis 6.3. And if we're honest, if we're honest, every single one of us has experienced the kindness of God. All of us have. The fact that the sun has risen and set upon us is a manifestation of God's kindness. That we experience the rains 
and the fruit of the ground and the food that we eat is a manifestation of God's kindness. Family relationships, friendship, work, the good things of this life, even adversity, all of us, if we're honest, can say that we have experienced the kindness of God, not the least of which God has given us both life and breath, of which he could have removed the moment that we had first cursed him or first looked away from him or first denied him. And he would have been just in doing so, and yet he continues to supply life and breath. All of us have shared in God's kindness and patience. And unless we repent and allow his kindness to have its right effect in our hearts, we are accumulating for ourselves wrath for the day of judgment. And so note fifth, the accumulation of self-righteousness. The accumulation of self-righteousness. Look at verse five. It says, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, You are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. A day is coming when the eternal wrath of God's righteous judgment will be fully revealed and will be justly executed on all those who die in their sin. And so you might be tempted to say that God's patience is a sign of weakness. It's not. The full fury of his righteous indignation will be realized. And in the meantime, should you persist in your self-righteousness, you are storing up wrath for yourself for that fateful day, accumulating for yourself a storehouse of eternal unending wrath to be unleashed upon you in accord with God's perfect justice, to be experienced following the final judgment in the lake of fire. And this on account of your hard-heartedness, your stubborn and unrepentant heart, where you are refusing to bow the knee of your heart to God and to give him glory. And so God says, come, come, Let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool, Isaiah 118. And so in this moment, it's as though God were making an appeal to you through me to be reconciled to him, to allow his kindness, his benevolence to lead you to repentance. And maybe you've been brought to the point now where you are wondering, how can I be made right with God? I've just experienced the full weight of the law of God, the full weight of my sin and the coming judgment. How can a a sinner like me be made right with God? You need two things, both of which are found in one person. You need a a perfect record of righteousness counted to you, and you need an atonement for your sin. You need both. You need God to graciously grant you a perfect record of righteousness, a perfect life, and you need the sin that you have committed against him to be atoned for, to be forgiven. And both realities are accomplished in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came into this world and lived a perfectly righteous life without sin, a perfect life lived out under the law, obeying the law in full, always doing those things that please the Father. And then he went to the cross and he offered himself on the cross as the one and only sacrifice for sin, where he was going to receive in himself the penalty due those who believe in him. He's going to die in their place, suffer in their place, take the wrath that they deserve. And he did that 
He drank the full cup of the Father's wrath for the sin of all who would ever believe on his name. He died, was buried, and on the third day, he rose again, proving he had conquered both sin and death. He ascended to the right hand of God and is seated now on the Father's throne and is awaiting that time when he will come in judgment. And yet, though that be true, Though either your death or his return are going to usher you into judgment, it doesn't have to end that way because you have just heard the good news of the gospel. The way of salvation has been made clear to you in this moment. That you can be reconciled to God by believing on his son, whom the father gave to be the sacrifice for sin, And whereby if you would trust in him, God the Father would take the righteousness of Christ and credit you with it, clothe you in it. Where he would look down upon you and not see your sin and wickedness since that was covered at the cross, but would see a perfect record of righteousness. Everything you need to stand holy and blameless. But to receive that, you have to abandon your self-righteousness. You can't look to anything else. You can't appeal to anything else. You can only have Christ. Christ is the only way by which you can be reconciled to God. And listen to Jesus. He says this. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so all you need to do is to turn from your sin and turn to Christ and believe on him and you will be saved. And the scripture promises that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so Paul has just shattered self-righteousness. Condemned it. Exposed it. Both the Reprobate the immoral person, the person who is clearly and evidently a sinner, as well as the self-righteous moralist who may be clean on the outside but is corrupt on the inside. Both are in the same predicament and both need to be delivered from the judgment of God. Jesus told a parable. And he told it to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. There were two men who went up into the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, among the religious elite, the most fastidious keepers of the law, at least on the outside. The other, a tax collector, the lowest of the low at the bottom of the barrel in Jewish culture and society. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, no less, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. That was his prayer in the temple to himself. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, wasn't even willing to lift his eyes up to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And then Jesus said this, I tell you, this man, referring to the tax collector, went to his house justified rather than the other. And then he says this, 
For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And that's what this comes down to. The one who is self-righteous is exalting him or herself. And in the end, what? He or she will be humbled. And the one who humbles themselves now by acknowledging what is true about their condition and looks to Christ for salvation is the one who is humbled now but will be what? Exalted later. And so this is the glory of the gospel. And Paul is going to continue to lay the foundation, building all the way to the end of chapter 3, when he will put forward Christ as the glorious demonstration of God's righteousness that he is, where in Christ, God justly punished sin for all those who believe on his name. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for your kindness and mercy in the way that you have worked in our lives to lead us to repentance. We are grateful, Father God, for this portion of scripture, which is a mirror for our heart to expose any and all self-righteousness for what it is, not righteousness. And Father, we would pray that if there be any here today who haven't yet looked to the Savior, that they would understand, be convicted of their sin, and look to him now and be saved and reconciled to you. Do that, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.